Who wants to have aprons?
Get on my way. simple dish. I think that uh, a lot of us understand that certain cultures have specific foods that belong to them. And so I think the wild rice for sure definitely belongs to us Anishinaabek people that defines us. Uh, so bigoje no min as we like to say in Anishinaabe moin. Wild rice. Bigoje no min. So what do you want to uh, you have anything so, to add? Uh, nope. <laughs> Probably just get right into it. Alrighty. Um, I've prepped a few things um, just to kind of speed things along a little bit. So we have our wild rice here. Usually we like to soak it overnight just so that it pops a little bit better. Uh, you can also buy the stuff that you don't have to soak, like the okay. commercial wild rice. But like you can also buy it from your Anishinaabe peddler from his trunk. And uh, you can buy that traditional stuff that you actually have to soak overnight. So I like to put a little bit of salt when you're soaking it overnight. Sometimes I like to use an onion broth, a nice cold onion broth to soak it overnight so it gives it that flavor. So you can get creative in that way. So to begin, um, you take your carrots and your celery, obviously, to make it a little bit more hearty. Just kind of... Up your salary. Same thing. Over there. I already did. I pre wash them. In that drawer. Another one. Yep. So chop up your salary, put it in your bowl. And we'll do the same thing with the carrot. And you take your pre-soaked rice, dump that in as well, and then the beef broth, as he's chopping carrots. When you're boiling, sometimes um, you'll lose broth. You can either add more water or add more beef broth. We, I, use, I like to use beef broth just to add flavor. Smudge your pan? Yeah. Okay. We got some runaway carrots. Is that good enough? No. Oh, what's wrong? Oh. What's that? You got a spirit, you got a spirit with us in the kitchen. You want to cut some more of these? No, that's enough. And you take your buffalo. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, is there wild rice on the island? The harvest? Or do you have the 
trade or buy it elsewhere? Well, a lot of the wild rice that we get uh, comes from uh, like southern Ontario or even the northern parts of Ontario. Uh, there are stories of, uh, there's a passageway between the eastern part of the island to the mainland in Killarney and there was like uh, rice fields that we used to have through there. So we'd be able to gather there and apparently there were also rice fields on the island. But they don't exist anymore. I don't know why. Could be because of uh, land development, changing the ecosystem. Uh, so um, a lot of things could have changed that. But uh, I believe a long time ago that there was a lot of wild rice. I mean, it was one of our staple foods, right? Yeah, it seems like Manitoulin Island has a Yeah, you're right about that. Uh, they have, uh, like the whole island is made up of limestone and dolomite, and that provides an awesome filtration for water. So this is why on the island it's actually beautiful green and blue water, right? You can see down like 20 feet. And uh, they say that it also, <clears throat> the island was never positioned there. It actually migrated from Niagara Falls and actually floated to the, where it sits uh, in the North Channel. And uh, they say that actually helps filter the waters because if you look at where it is, it's almost where the hub is, like Lake Superior, Lake Huron, and Lake Michigan right there, right? So it kind of filters the waters as it goes through those lakes. So you want to brown your buffalo in the pan, obviously. Season it however you like to. I usually just add salt, pepper, maybe some onion salt, garlic salt. Is this where we speed the process up? Yep, so I'm, I'm speeding up the process here. So I've already pre-boiled my soaked wild rice and my celery and my corn, or corn, carrots. What you want to do is once that is cooked, you want to pour it into a pan. And like I said, you want to cook your rice until it pops, so it's nice and tender. And then add in your buffalo. Mix it up here. Yeah, we'll see what it looks like. So mix in your buffalo, your rice. Lots of different versions of this casserole. Um, this specific one obviously has been passed down by generations. This one came from Stephen's grandmother, Linda, which gave to her mom, or his mom, Sherry. So then you want to add in your cream of mushroom soup. Bought you guys back home, but I sure do love the smell of wild rice. There's a process with that too, that old traditional process, eh? There's actual songs that belong to this rice, and there's actual dances that belong to this rice. And so those people that still practice that, you know, my hands off to that because it is a long process to get it from that from that husk into the canoe and then back home and then singing those songs and actually dancing on it to release, release it. Oh, kind of looks funny, eh, when I go to the store and people see me and put my tobacco down before I take a box of wild rice off the shelf. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and dance around with it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> down the aisles. Dancing in the store. 
So I used a large can of the mushroom soup, and you can tell by the texture that it looks, it may be a little bit dry. So I think I'm gonna add in the smaller can of mushroom soup. This dish I usually make for our feast foods, and it's one of the first foods to go. My kids love it. My mom and dad love it. One of our favorites. So it has a good texture here. We like to um, add mozzarella cheese. That's always optional. Like I said, there's different variations of the casserole itself, so however you, or you, you feel, I'm going to take all your taste buds. So, now that that's all mixed in, we're waiting for our oven to preheat. One thing I like to put in here is, uh, and you forgot to add that on our list, was the, uh, I like to put mozzarella cheese on that, this. I just said that. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah. Were you listening? You no, never I listen. Never listen. You that. never listen. You never huh? listen. That's true. You never listen. So anyways, you kind of flatten it out through your pan here. I'll just go back over here. Yeah, again. go back over there. And then pop it in the oven for roughly 20 minutes. Is it warm? Yeah. Okay. And then how long you put it in here? Like 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Roughly 20 minutes. And that's your wild rice casserole. So I hope you guys have been taking notes at home. The one ingredient we forgot to mention was love. <laughs> and laughter. Yeah, and laugh. laughter. Yeah, you gotta have that laughter, eh? Cooking in our kitchen is always fun. <laughs> always fun. So is your, uh, once your broth gets going, what's the broth for? For your rice? The, yeah, I cook the rice in the broth. Mm -hmm. And then once your wild rice is opened up, do you drain everything? No. No, because I let the, I let it cook down all the way. Hey, you, re you let it render down, eh? Yeah. All the liquids. And then the buffalo obviously is not very fatty, so you don't have to drain any grease off of that either. That light giving me flashbacks yeah. from, from boomers. Shush. <laughs> 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 gonna start dancing over there. Start clubbing at <laughs> at the at the blue gator. Yeah. <laughs> on checking especially with the cheese I like to put I like to have a crispy cheese on top so you can leave it in until the cheese starts browning but basically you're sticking it in the oven to bring everything together heat the, the mushroom soup that you just added so of course you want that to be cooked fully and I mean like once you experiment with this I mean, you can disguise the limit. You can put anything in there. You can put ricotta cheese, gold cheese. You can put your own vegetable twist on there. Chives. Oh, that never strong. Yeah. The rice? No, that meat. Oh, the meat, the buffalo? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Taste the pain in it, the wild meat. Yeah. So if you're using wild meat, you definitely want to season that pretty good. So that was pretty, I don't think there was any salt or no pepper added to that at all. But with gamey meat, you want to definitely find that bay leaves actually take game gaminess out of it, eh? Game bay leaves. Like even like back in the day, they even uh, made this with beaver because of the amount of fat that it contained, right? Yeah, it's been moose meat. Yeah, moose meat. Meat. Definitely. Venison. Yeah, deer. If anybody's out there in a duck, Pat's Blue Ribbon, put your duck on top of that Pat's Blue Ribbon on an open fire. Whew. Off with your own issue. I think that's pretty much it. Are we waiting for it to come out? Yeah, just wait for it to come out. So this is the time me and Tanya would go and watch an episode of uh, Family Food. We're getting old. We like our game shows now. No, I'm just kidding. What are some of your other specialties? Mine or his? Yours, honey. Mine. Some of my other favorite specialties, obviously, is corn. But my kids like corn soup. Um, let's see. I think every more traditional food, squash, you know, right. yeah, I, my fried bread, obviously, I mean, it's not traditional food, but um, everybody has their own version of fried bread as well, so um, the corn soup and the wild rice, there's lots of ways to cook that, as, that too, it just depends on what your taste buds like, um, let's see, what else, what else do you like, Tristan? Besides the casserole, the soup, wild rice soup, corn soup. Anything that I don't have to cook and that she cooks, it's delicious. <laughs> yeah, she cooks awesome. Yeah. Well, we all know where she gets her cooking skills, right? Yeah. Julia Jackson's food stand, you know, that breast has gone down from her dad, passed down to her. Hopefully she passes it down to our daughters, Tristan and Jasmine. And so you can hear our latest addition to the family in the background there. Our grandbaby. Our grandbaby. So she's next in line for the recipe. <laughs> and the thing is, they uh, they got a lot of things going on at Seven Generation there, and I like what they do is they they have this beautiful garden that they can that they harvest from, and it's a community garden. So like some of these vegetables that we're using actually come from that garden, right? The carrots. Yeah, we have lots of green peppers and kale, onion, we have onion in there as so well. If you can do that now, I'm sure a lot of people during this pandemic has actually experimented with their green thumb this year. I know I got a black thumb, I don't leave that to Tanya. But uh, yeah, that sustainability of having your own garden is uh, quite rewarding, I guess, when you're able to take it from your garden, or even when you go fishing, right, you're able to bring it home, and it's that old traditional way of providing, right? So, I mean, you've got your garden going on, you can grow all kinds of squash, all kinds of green beans. That's what I like about 7 Gen, if they're, when, they're, when they're not there at work, I sneak in their gardens, and Take tomatoes, no, I'm just kidding. There's lots of Roma tomatoes over there right now. I think Lee actually canned some Roma tomatoes last week. So we have lots of tomatoes over there, which we like to put in our soups. Hominy soup, that's another one that the girls like, my spicy hominy soup. That one came from my dad. I love his hominy soup. You guys tried to grow, did you record over there? We did, yes. 
We have the three sisters there. We have the corn, beans, and squash right outside the greenhouse where we're growing our salmon. We have lots of tobacco plants over there as well. So. Yeah, that's hard to, have you ever tried to grow Indian corn? No. no. It's hard. Like, I don't have any luck with plants. You and me are in the same boat then, eh? Yeah. You can't even grow those simple ivies, eh? You know those ones that your grandma used to have or your mom used to have them that grew along the walls and on the ceiling? I can't even do that. Marcella had in our terrible store presentation office uh, her office was boxing a little demonstration, cooking demonstration. Her husband Lee is an amazing gardener. Oh, yeah. They have a bunch of raised uh, beds in their back 40 there that always yield just so much wonderful food and they share it with other family members and friends. So we're always grateful when uh, Lisa and I come home from work and there's a box of fresh veggies on our porch and we had them. We appreciate people when we have the patience and uh, bring them the Grow things like that. Oh, it's, it's very tough work. Like, I mean, like we try to grow a garden ourselves, and we have a little tiny squash yeah. like that. We we didn't yield too much <laughs> from it this year, but hopefully next year we're thinking about doing res bed or raised res beds. Hey. <laughs> Tell me about your house. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, our, we started them inside in the spring, and our cucumbers took right off. Our cucumbers did really well. Our carrots did really well. And then when we transplanted them into the ground, I mixed the, um, the, what you, well, the dairy dew into my soil. And I don't think I mixed enough in there because once they got into the ground, they just kind of flopped. Plus, we have brown moles that were going in and ruining that soil yeah, as lots well. Lots of berry moles. I yeah. We had a rabbit come through there and <laughs> ravaged our carrots, little tiny wobbles, trying to catch them. And then, uh, but like I said, the backbreaking part was the weeding, right? You let it go and you get, you come back after a week of neglect and then you gotta get on your hands and knees and pull those things out. And I remember seeing my grandma out there a lot, say, and when I did that this year, it gave me like a lot of respect for what she did when she was in that garden. Right? Are you making a soup too? No. So the wild rice that's cooking in the pan with the carrots and the celery, it's boiling down quite a bit and it's not popping. So I'm going to add some more water. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's boiling pretty good. You could make wild rice soup like that too, right? Yep, you could do soup like this as well. Exactly. Yeah. There's a vegan version where you obviously cook it without any type of meat. Same recipe, just without the meat. Yeah, you've seen a wild rice salad before. Yeah. Diced up lettuce, cherry tomatoes, with a vinaigrette. Yeah, I've seen lots of variations. Yeah. The sweet meat wild rice with cranberries and raisins and whatnot. Like I say, like cold food coming into a modern, you know, developing into time. a modern dish, mm -hmm. right? Do we have to show them that we are going to eat it too? 
You have to dish it out like they're cooking shows. Mm -hmm. Try it out. Presentation. Uh, go back to the garden and grab some, uh, some garnish leaf. Some parsley? Yeah. No, a big rhubarb leaf. Yeah, big rhubarb leaf. <laughs> I don't know if you remember uh, James Brew. He's a good traditional dancer, but I, anyways, he uh, he went to school for cooking, eh? And he's like the lead chef up there for the Needle and All Sands, I think. And he's done like variations on like old school foods and brought it into a modern time, right? With using everything that's around us now, and he's created quite a menu over there. So I've been meaning to go up there and check it out because it's pretty amazing stuff that I've heard he's been doing up there. Those Great Lakes uh, food summits are always amazing. Oh yeah? Yeah, all those indigenous chefs come together and they just cook and share ideas, recipes, different fusions together from different parts of the country. I think the last one was held in Pima, Iowa last year. The Misquaki um, tried oh, to host it. But they even had chefs that came up from Central America. Oh, wow. Yeah. I know um, Clinton and Lee from Seven Gen went over to the one in Oneida. And then uh, Clinton went to the one down in Dewajak where they did the smoked meat in the teepees and whatnot. He said it was awesome. Really, really awesome. So I think those food summits are really a nice place to be able to even trade seeds, right? Mm -hmm. For That's different good. gardens. Yeah, there is a guy back home too. Uh, he worked for the, um, the golf course in their kitchen. And he... Uh, I had some guests from China and he actually used the local wild goods from Manitoulin. He went out and grabbed all the stuff from, from the bush, hey? Eh? And he actually made a kimchi for them out of all the wild stuff that was there. And uh, the, those Asians were really impressed at what, what he brought to the table, eh? He, he brought this from here, he got that there. You know, you just got this this morning, you could taste the freshness, you know? It was great. It's good to see indigenous. Uh, cooks out there, yeah. First Nation cooks. That's a, this is as far as I'm going to get. No, I'm just going to take it. What do you think, Mama Bear? Still not bubbling yet. I like to wait for the crispy layer on the top, and then you can see the soup actually bubbling in the bottom. That's usually when I pull it out of the oven. Um, yeah, we could turn up the heat. <laughs> hey, get on there. If you find an Indian in your cupboard, it's probably your cousin. <laughs>
You know what? I was thinking just now. We should try chicken next time. Putting chicken in it? Chicken with a little bit, a little bit of bacon. Chicken and bacon. So we got a, we ended up investing in some chickens. We got a duck. And so yesterday we just found out that our duck laid eggs. So we're trying to figure out if we can eat those. Would assume you eat that so, yeah, yeah. I would assume so. I know that in uh, I think it's Vietnam or uh, somewhere over there, they actually eat hard-boiled uh, duck eggs with the embryo still inside of it. So they eat, it's like a hard-boiled egg once you peel the shell off, and inside it's a hard-boiled egg, but you got the, the duck embryo still inside, so you're eating like little duck bill, and little duck legs, all surrounded and cased by the egg yolk itself. So I was like, I mean, if they can do it, I guess we can do it. Right. 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 I know back home, uh, some of those Nishnag, they still gather seagull eggs. And uh, you can only gather them at a certain time of the year, and that's usually in the uh, first, first week in May, I guess. Last week in April. You got like a two week window because they, then they start to become babies, eh? So, but they say too many of those eggs because they're high in protein, very high in protein, that they can make you sick if you eat too many, which is like a, a lot of things, too much of it is bad for us. So, I've never actually tried seagull eggs, but I've been, I, I've been meaning to try it. guys are dangerous. I don't know if you have these at home folks. Get a chain mail glove when you're working with this thing. <laughs> because I've seen people lose bits of their nails, bits of their finger. And I ended up cutting one of my uh, pieces of uh, finger and I still got a scar right there you can see it's like a little boob and I don't have no feeling there anymore but that little piece of bread or the, where it was I couldn't find it because there's this bread everywhere and so I just kind of scraped it in the bowl Yeah, that mandolin though, you definitely need a chain mail glove for this. So, I mean, people try to get it right down to the bone, you know, like with that carrot, every last bit of that carrot or that celery, sometimes they forget that their fingers are there. Don't waste.
we keep opening the door, you know. Looks like the city's pretty heated. Yeah. Yeah. Should have brought the cribbing for it. Right, while well, we're sitting and waiting. <laughs> Getting there. In the official taste test today. <laughs> when are they going to come up with a with a stove that you can talk to, like Alexa? Oh, and it'll just do everything hey, for hey, you. Turn it on, huh? Like Back to the Future, yeah. like food. LG, turn it to boil. <laughs> Technology. Turn it to simmer. Technology. Or even a, one that has a radio in it. Very. I'm very hearing the time by the light now. Cooking shows now becoming a uh, do it yourself, home fix it. No, I'm just gonna, <laughs> <laughs> gonna take a, I'm gonna change the overhead here. Yeah. Go open the door. No. 
There's got to be a light. Check it out, then. I think the light is on. It's just difficult to see it. when you're not cooking in your own kitchen, right? You know the temperature of your stove and you know how you're He's got electric heat, but when the power went out, we had to rely on his wood stove. And that thing was, once we got it cooking, and it got hot in there, and he's like, man, I'm so hungry. But the dang stove doesn't work. I said, no, we got a stove downstairs, piping hot right now. So we ended up making hamburgers and french fries. We had a little pot on the stove there that had oil in it. Cut the french fries, threw them in there, and... We made hamburger on a cast iron skillet on that stove. said is it has some cheese on there yeah. and you can see the creaminess from the cream of mushroom of course right what's it that looks like
want to say thank you to Z Bluing for allowing us to give us our demonstration. And for allowing us to come into your home. <laughs> and